This is the Comics Alternative Manga, reviews of five Kitaro volumes, and Mangasia, the definitive guide to Asian comics. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Manga. I'm Derek. And I'm Shay. And we're two guys with advanced degrees, or almost advanced degrees, who love to talk about manga. And on the January episode of the manga series, Shay and I are going to be discussing a series of titles, but basically we break the show into two parts. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the first five volumes of the Kitaro series that Drawn and Quarterly has been putting out. And of course, this is by Shigeru Mizuki. And then after that, we're going to look at Paul Gravitz. Mangasia, the definitive guide to Asian comics. But before we get to that discussion, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Manga is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some mind-blowing specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off of the cover price. Sometimes 50% off cover. But every now and again, you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. Like this month, you can get volumes of Katsuhiro Otomo's Akira, which we've talked about on the show before, for 25% off. And you can get volumes of Trigon for 80% off. That's right. You know, every single month you're going to find great specials on manga and other comics at Discount Comic Book Service. So definitely check them out. Go to dcbservice.com. We guarantee you they will take care of all of your manga and comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Shay and Derek sent you. Shay, before you and I get into this month's titles, let's talk about some of the messages we've received regarding the last manga episode. Mail time. Mail time. Ooh, the mail's here. That means we get to see our old friend, Mailbox. Listeners may remember that one of the texts that we discussed was the first volume in Kadanchan's uh, new releases of Battle Angel Alita. Mm-hmm. And I found that we got quite a flurry <laughs> of communication in the several days following the release of that episode. And, and it's interesting. I have found over the years, since you and I have been doing this manga uh-huh. series, which has been over two years now, it's going on three, mm-hmm. I guess, that uh, there tends to be more reaction from listeners to the manga series than to anything else we do on the comics alternative. And that includes the other monthly series and the weekly review show. So I don't know if that says something about us or if it says (laughs) something about our listeners or just manga, uh, but it does tend to generate more commentary, which is good. We, We do love to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. And in the commentary, there are three main responses that I want to share, and they come from three different platforms. And the first one comes through Twitter. And this is someone who's been following the Comics Alternative for a while and who has communicated with us in the past. Uh, His Twitter handle is Zach Fig, and we've talked about him before in the show. Hello. Uh, He responds to our commentary on Battle Angel Alita, and he said, love the review of Battle Angel Alita, but just wanted to clarify something. Panzerkunst is not a move, but rather a style. Think of it as Taekwondo or Karate. 
Also, the plump lips of Alita actually become a bit of a gag since she gets the nickname of Octopus Lips, though that's rarely used. So, yeah, we did make—I guess we did call Panzerkunst a move. I don't remember that, but it's it's a style— Apparently, and thank you, Zach Fig, for clarifying that. And also for that comment about Alita's lips. Now, that gets back to something that, Shay, I think you pointed out Mm -hmm. in our discussion of Battle Mm -hmm. Angel Alita. You were talking about her kind of uh, kind of a cute moe look, which Mm -hmm. contrasted with the way that almost everyone else was represented in that first volume. Yeah. And in fact, this is something that longtime listener and emailer Jason Rulane commented on. And, and again, this came through email. And in fact, we should mention that Jason sends us quite a number of email and keeps us in the loop about upcoming releases. And we very much appreciate that. But this email in particular was a reaction to our comments about the cuteness of Alita. He says, there's an important plot reason why Alita, parenthetically Yoko, looks like she does. This plot is hinted at in Last Order when we see current Queen of Mars in Last Order, and Yoko herself, including hibernation period, is about 300 years old. The actual reason is revealed in the third arc of the Mars Chronicle. So Alita looking different from people in the scrapyard with her natural pouty lips makes sense when you see what's going on in Mars. And Battle Angel Alita is post-apocalyptic, but it's post-apocalyptic with colonies on other planets. And so Jason, along with Zach Fig on Twitter, points out that there is a reason why she looks the way that she does. So thanks to both of you for those comments. And then another one we received last month, or I guess it could have even been uh, early January, uh, came through YouTube. And the user who commented on our YouTube channel uh, has the handle Shogjwar, S-H-O-G-J-W-A-R. And this individual writes, nice, just so you know, Mars Chronicle is a prequel to Battle Angel Alita and is Shahiro's newest work. And we appreciate that. However, maybe we weren't clear. We weren't suggesting that Mars Chronicles takes place in terms of story world, you know, the the narrative time, after the events that take place in Battle Angel Alita, but that the books, Mars Chronicle, Battle Angel Alita, Mars Chronicle, (laughs) uh, came or were published after Battle Angel Alita, the initial volumes. And so I guess there was a bit of a mix up there. Perhaps we weren't clear on that. But we do appreciate you making those comments on our YouTube channel, Shogjwar, if that's how you pronounce that name. Uh, we, again, we, we really do like hearing from all of our listeners correcting us as well as singing our praises. So, Shay, you want to get into the January manga that we're going to be discussing? Yes, this uh, momentous second January episode. Let's do it. Yes. Um, So the first title, or I guess we should say titles, that we're going to be looking at is uh, the first five volumes in the Kitaro series that Drawn and Quarterly started to publish back in May of 2016. Now, in 2013, Drawn and Quarterly published Shigeru Mizuki's Kitaro, which is a larger volume that con- collects a, a variety of different stories of Kitaro published between 1967 and 1968. But this new series that they began uh, almost a couple of years ago is a smaller sized book, more pocket size, and to some degree, I guess, and we could discuss this, uh, they're arranged kind of chronologically, not really. 
Um, but there's more of an order to them uh-huh. instead of just a collection of various Kataro stories. And the first volume that they published in May of 2016 was The Birth of Kataro. And then in October of that year, the second volume, Kataro meets Nurahuran. And then in June of 2017, Kataro, The Great Tanuki War. And then in October of 2017, Kitaro's Strange Adventures. And then just this month, they published Kitaro the Vampire Slayer. So, so far we have five of these volumes. And, and you and I thought that it would be fun to discuss all five of these books because it is a series. And another reason why we wanted to do this is, well... Kitaro is an important character in manga history, but also both of us really enjoy the work of Siguri Mizuki, whom we've discussed uh, one or two times on the show in the past. Yes, if I remember correctly, we uh, recorded our episode about uh, his... Shigeru Mizuki's Hitler? Hitler, like the day before he he passed... um, unfortunately yeah yeah that was weird because we (laughs) we recorded the show and then i remember the day it went up early that morning i saw on the news feed that i had up at the time that uh, shigeru mizuki had just passed the day that our show (laughs) was going up so that was unfortunate and we do hope that there is no link whatsoever even (laughs) even a correlation uh, between what we do on the manga series and the health of the people that we discuss. No, and and that actually is a is a interesting entree into talking about um, about Kitaro. Um, you know, one of uh, a detail from the Paul Gravette book we will uh, talk about later is um, there is this uh, phenomenon of uh, death by overwork that's. Um, not uncommon for cartoonists. Um, and uh, Mizuki, uh, what was the quote? He has this really, he ended, he ended up living to be 96. Um, and he's got this great quote about, uh, um, I work much slower than my my contemporaries, but they're all dead and I'm still alive or something like that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, he's, he's an interesting, he's an interesting cartoonist. And, uh, well, that was, you know, it was unfortunate that he, he passed, you know, he did leave a, a very, he led a very long life. Um, you know, he was drawing these comics, uh, with one arm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, uh, it's just incredible. The, um, what he was able to accomplish um, over a very long life. Um, yeah, that, that's right. And, and in fact, that, that kind of brings us back to these Kitaro volumes because uh, they're translated by Zach Davison, whom you know we've discussed quite a number of times on the show. And in addition to doing the translation, in all the volumes that we have so far, we also have a selection of the history of, of Shigeru Mizuki, which I find interesting. On the one hand, it would be great to have this history or biography of Mizuki and Kitaro in one volume. On the other hand, this kind of to-be-continued quality of how every volume in this new Kitaro series opens with a segment of this history, I kind of like that. It gives me something else to look forward to in how Davison is chronicling Mizuki's life, especially as it applies to Kitaro. And one of the things that Davison makes clear in several of these segments, you know, these histories that open each of the volumes, is the fact that Mizuki plays to his own drummer, so to speak. Um, That he, one of the reasons why it took him a while to get a leg up in the world of manga is that he wouldn't do what a lot of other people wanted him to do Uh in other words he didn't follow certain trends he wanted to do his own thing and take it in directions where he thought was was productive not necessarily what a publisher or even readers would necessarily want and so that leads back to to that quote or the paraphrase from gravit that you mentioned that you know he wasn't as hard working 
he was doing his own thing. And, uh, and, and that's something that definitely stands out with uh, these Kataro stories because they're weird at times. And you can see that he's doing his own thing. Uh, yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, uh, Mizuki's kind of relationship to the manga publishing industry is, I, I think, kind of inextricable um, from the the kind of life of Kitaro, shall we say. Um, you know, it originally started as, uh, and you can see it in, in the first volume um, that you mentioned, The Birth of Kitaro. It's, there's, um, you know, it's not like, certainly not by today's standards would I describe it as, you know, scary. Um, but there's a much stronger emphasis on um, horror mm-hmm. and and uh, the tone is a little darker than some of, um, of the later volumes. And, um, you know, the publishing history of the Kitaro character, um, you know, it involves, uh, you know, changing the... Uh, tone to reflect audience expectations. Um, if I remember correctly, it originally started as, um, and this I, I could be wrong about this, and I'm looking to see if I can confirm this, um, but I believe the series started as um, something Mizuki was doing for the rental manga market, mm-hmm. um, which is... Um, you know, has constraints and um, an audience that's different from the kind of constraints you would have at uh, a different, like a weekly magazine or a monthly magazine or or that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah, I think you're right to pick up on Mizuki's, I think... Uniqueness? Yeah, I think describing him, like you said, as, as kind of he marches to the beat of his own drum is, is a accurate way to describe it. But that, that quality to his work and his personality... Um, and how he had to kind of negotiate that with, um, the publishing industry at at the time or over, um, uh, 10 years at least, um, is I think important to, to kind of consider in this conversation about how the character of Kitaro changes from some of these earlier stories to, um, some of the later stories. Yeah. Um, now you're you're pronouncing the name as Kitaro, and I have said Kitaro. Is am I placing the accent inappropriately? Um. Uh, that's a good question. I hadn't thought of it. I just uh, Kitaro. Uh, it could be Kitaro. Um, there is some diacritical mark over the O. Uh, so maybe it's Kitaru. I, I don't know. Um, some listener will. <laughs> send us an email about how we're mispronouncing it. But I um, I never really thought about it. I just kind of um, reflexively pronounced it Kitaro. But mm-hmm. um, mine, I could very well be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one of the things, you know, however you pronounce the name, one of the things that Zach Davison does in his history of Kitaro, Kitaro, is points out how Kitaro or Kitaro <laughs> has changed um, depending on the context. And as you mentioned, when Shigeru Mizuki began Kitaro, he did so in a more horrific way, right? So mm-hmm. there was something more overtly perhaps adult or uh, horror infused than the cuter Kitaro that we have now uh-huh. in these yeah. volumes. It's and, definitely, it was definitely a darker, yes. a darker tone in some of those earlier. Right. Stories. Especially. Yeah. It, for the rental market. And mm-hmm. you know, you could even see in the very first story in the first book, the birth of Kitaro, the story, the birth of Kitaro, which was originally published in Gatto in March of 1966. And by the way, I like it that in all of these volumes you have in the table of contents an indication of when and where that story was first published. So and this this will get back to something that I want us to discuss at some point, the chronology of mm-hmm. the or, – or maybe the arrangement, chronological arrangement of these various volumes. And so this first volume includes stories 
between published between 1966 and 1968. In this first one, the birth of Kitaro that was published in Gatto in March of that year, mm-hmm. the art looks markedly different, especially when you see the mm-hmm. way that Kitaro was represented. Um, he looks very different from the Kitaro that we have on the front and back covers. Yeah, it's um, it's been quite a while since I've read that volume. Um, I think I read it when it first came out, um, so I could be mistaken. But uh, he draws his his drawing is a lot cleaner than it is in some of these earlier volumes. Unless I'm mistaken, is that um, is that true, or or how would you describe the differences in in kind of the aesthetics? I would say it's cleaner and more rounded than mm-hmm. we have with. Um, uh, the the early stories, especially that first one. And in fact, the way that Kitaro is drawn in that first story in the first volume, The Birth of Kitaro, it reminded me a lot of Hideshi Hino. And the way that, especially the Hell Baby, which we discussed a little over a year ago for our, our October episode, um, because Hell Baby has those eyes that are popping out, uh-huh. and you have the prominence of Kitaro's eyes, and it, I don't know, it just reminded me of, of Hino's style in that first story. But then after the first story, and we get to the next one, which is, oh, I can't, oh, 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 uh, Nizumi Otoku versus Niko Masumi, uh, things are starting to look cute. And mm-hmm. this was a story that was published originally in 1967. So we're a little more than a year after the mm-hmm. first story that we have in this collection, The Birth of mm-hmm. Kitaro. So, again, the style, the art has had uh, time to, to shift a bit. I, don't wanna, mm-hmm. I was about to say mature, but that is not necessarily the case. It just evolves to where mm-hmm. we have kind of a more rounded, cleaner look of Kitaro than we did in that first story. Yeah, I mean— uh, that is interesting. Um, I I don't think I picked up on the fact that um, the um, stories weren't strictly in chronological uh, order. Um, so I think my reading experience was um, I kind of understood them as as kind of contiguous, um, and uh, you know I did pick up on some of those shifts between stories as aesthetic shifts that you, um, were talking about. Um, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah, I was, my understanding was that they were, they were publishing them, um, chronologically, but apparently that's not the case. How did that, um, I am, I am curious how, um, that kind of affected your reading experience, reading them as, um, um, maybe more anthological, um, you know, this, this collection drawn from a, you know, a number of different periods, um, being aware of that, do you, you know, how do you think that that affected your kind of reading of the, the volume? You know, I don't think it would have affected me at all unless, um, hold on. I'm trying to get to, there's one, there's only one place that I can recall that I was, a little not confused but thrown off by any potential chronological or lack thereof mm-hmm. issue um and, and that occurs in this fourth volume Kitaro's Strange Adventures that came out late last year and in particular the story the demon bail and in fact there are two demon stories in this collection there is the demon bail which appeared in weekly shonen sunday in december mm-hmm. of 1971 and then the one toward the end of this volume, The Demon Belial, which appeared in Weekland Shonen Magazine in April of 1968. So at the end of the story, The Demon Bail, the, the mm-hmm. one that came out in 1971, the way that uh, Kitaro and others decide to get rid of this demon who is a real menace, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's not just yokai. He is a demon. Uh, And so the various yokai have a problem in in getting rid of this danger. But the way that they do it is that they let loose—oh, God, what is this beast's name? Um, uh, 
uh, Yakanzuru. And so this Yakanzuru is a creature, a yokai, that looks like, the way it's, he's described, kind of a big teapot. And for, where the spout would be for a teapot is, I guess, this yokai's intake. And he kind of sucks everything in. And once you're sucked into this creature, this yokai, mm -hmm. then you go to another dimension. And the way that this story ends, right, uh, the demon Baal, both Kitaro and his father, Medema Oyaji, mm -hmm. you know, the, the eyeball, the walking eyeball. <laughs> and and we, in fact, we need to get to the premise for those who may not know about Kitaro because it is really wacky. But um, Kitaro and his father are sucked into this yokai, and that's how the story ends. And when I turn the page to the next story, which is uh, Iyami, which was originally published in December of 1971. But a, that week or so before the demon Baal was released, I was expecting, okay, well, what happened to K Kitaro and his father? Are they in this other dimension? No yes, mention yes. of that. That's the only place that the lack of chronology kind of threw me because uh -huh. there was no resolution to, you know, where are they? Are they in another dimension? Other than that, though, you know, I wouldn't have known unless I looked at the table of contents that there was any kind of mm -hmm. non-chronological arrangement of these stories. So, for instance, in this second volume, Kitaro meets Nurahiyan, uh, mm -hmm. there is a story from 1978, uh, Datsui Baba, and that's sandwiched between two pieces that came out, in, you know, one in October of 67 and then another in December of 67. Mm -hmm. But the content and the style is not so markedly different uh -huh. that I sensed a kind of rupture or bump, if you will, in terms of chronology. Because each of these stories, for all practical purposes, stand on their own, uh -huh. right? So you don't necessarily have to read one to appreciate what goes on in another, although sometimes a little context would help. Mm -hmm. So do you think – I mean I saw you post on Goodreads yesterday about uh, – Kitro and the the Great Tanuki War, um, and um, so I, I am curious whether or not you thought, um, you know, for for listeners, that volume is uh, unlike the other volumes. Um, it is mostly one sustained story. There are, I think, two or three shorter stories um, after, but this one kind of story arc occupies the bulk of this volume. Um, do you think then that uh, that that volume uh, kind of works better than other volumes that are more anthological, um, whereas this the the Great Tanuki War is more kind of um, coherent? Or do you think that, uh, or, or 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 would you hesitate to put one necessarily above the other? I don't know. I rem yeah, I recall that comment that I made on Goodreads uh, about the Great Tanuki War, which is the third volume in this series. Um, yeah, the Great Tanuki War appeared in Weekly Shonen Magazine between July and September of 1967. So it is more epic in scale. It is mm -hmm. the longest narrative that we have of the first five volumes so far, right? Um, and I remember when I read this, my feeling, and just completely subjective, right, not critical, uh -huh. was, uh -huh. oh, this is maybe a little too long. Let's get to the end of this. And I found myself enjoying this volume less than I did the two previous. Mm -hmm. And I guess because my expectations were set with the more anthological, as you, as you were saying, uh -huh. approach with the first two volumes and actually – you know, volumes four and five as well, where you have a variety of short stories that kind of stand on their own and aren't that long at all. And so when I got to the Great Tanuki War, and not just the volume, but that story within this third uh -huh. volume, it's like, oh, this is long. And so I remember speculating on Goodreads, I wonder if Kitaro is better suited to a shorter form uh -huh. than longer, more novella-type works. 
Mm-hmm. That is, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was going to kind of be my my follow up was um, just, I mean, do you think that Kitaro uh, works works better as um, these kind of one offs? Uh, you know, from for my money, it's uh, it's a difficult question to answer because I, I was a big fan of that um, particular story arc, the Great Tanuki War. Um, you know, but like you, there I have a I have a fondness for those shorter stories and um, those collections of shorter stories because I do think Mizuki, uh his short stories, I mean, are are really strong. Um, you know, he's not a he's not a cartoonist that um, really should only work in longer format work. Um, you know, he's got a really good grasp on how to make a short story um, uh, have you know have an entire story, um, but have it you know, move at a certain pace, um, uh, you know, have it be funny, um, and, you know, uh, offer a, a pretty good amount of closure by the story's end. So you can kind of pick it up, read it, enjoy it, put it down and not have to worry about, um, you know, following that story at some point in the future. Um, it kind of sounds like you are, uh, uh, you could, you would kind of agree with with the idea that Mizuki is a maybe a stronger short storyteller. Uh, you know, I, maybe, um, and, and I say it without being convinced um, because we really don't have in English many examples of his long form storytelling that aren't historically based. Right, that's true. So, so. What immediately comes to mind in terms of longer narratives is one that we discussed uh, about a year and a half ago, Shigeru Mizuki's Hitler. And then we have that, what was it, a five-volume series, Showa, which Showa, is magnificent, yeah. right? And, you know, both the Hitler book and the five volumes of Sho- – or maybe it's four volumes of Showa, Showa – four um, – are historically based. So he's telling a story and it's a long form story, but it's not a work of fiction or Mm -hmm. fantasy or whatever you choose to call it. The only other examples we have of his longer form storytelling in English, at least that's been translated for us, uh, is the, uh, the very first uh, book that drawn and quarterly published of Mizuki's onward toward our noble deaths. Mm -hmm. Um, because I believe that Nononba, which followed that, is shorter stories as well, correct? Um, stories yes, that I, Nononba, I, who helped care for the young Mizuki as he was growing mm-hmm. up, um, stories that she told him. Yeah, I believe that is a collection of short stories as well. Yeah, it's been a, wee, a while since I've I've read that collection, but yeah, but but I you know I really liked Onward toward our, toward our Noble Deaths. So I think coming back to the Great Tanuki War, that my expectations were one way, right? That this was going to be a shorter story, but when it wasn't, that's when I wondered, well, does this work or not? I have to say though that in the most recent volume, the one that came out just this month, Kitaro the Vampire Slayer. I've kind of readjusted uh, my my feelings about maybe Mizuki working better, at least the Kataro series, with mm-hmm. short, shorter form, because the main story, the title story, Kataro the Vampire Slayer, takes up a, or actually the story is called the Vampire Eret, E R Y T, the Vampire Eret. Um, this takes up may almost, maybe not quite three quarters of this volume. Mm -hmm. And so this is almost as long as the great Tanuki war. And I really enjoyed the story, the vampire air. It was one of my favorites of all of the stories in the first five volumes so far. And I guess because the vampire is an outstanding character, right? So this Mm -hmm. is a Western monster who makes his way to Japan. And so visually he stands out, from the yokai that populate Kataro's world. Another thing that's so striking about the vampire Eret is the way that they describe him. It's kind of a, a hipster mop top. And I guess he <laughs> is. I mean, this story originally came out in what, 19, in June of 19, between May and June of 1967. So this is when the British invasion was really at its height, as we were getting, I guess, 
getting, at least in America, out of the British invasion into more psychedelia, right? Because 67 mm-hmm. is the year, the summer of love, uh, Sergeant uh-huh. Peppers and all of that. But, you know, <laughs> there's still this kind of mop-top hipster kind of uh-huh. uh, trend that's going on. And I guess that Mizuki was trying to make Eret look something like uh, a mod or a beetle, if you want mm-hmm. to look at it that way. Because and he plays the guitar, and the guitar is this kind of magical force that the vampire Eret expels, right? In order to lure people, it's one of the one of the things that he does in in terms of getting people in his clutch. I mean, there are other things that he does as well. But anyway, that longer story I really enjoyed. So that had me going back to rethink my appreciation of the Great Tanuki War. No, that's a good point because um, I'm a big fan. I was a big fan of the Great Tanuki War, and I I really enjoyed uh, um, the Vampire Air. That was one of my favorite stories as well. Um, So um, maybe maybe a better way to think about it is not that Mizuki is necessarily better at one or the other, but that um, the having those longer stories is maybe some to like punctuate the shorter stories in some way. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that, that having that juxtaposition of, of one and then the other, um, is a, is a pretty good way to construct those volumes and that series. Um, because it's, uh, you know, you don't get too bogged down with the shorter stories. You know, you have opportunities or Mizuki has opportunities to kind of um, tell longer stories, um, but he's not necessarily beholden to one uh, format or the other. Um. That makes sense. And so, yeah, I hesitate getting back to one of your earlier questions, you know, whether I think he's better suited for longer or shorter form. I hesitate because, well, you know, there are pluses and minuses, and maybe that's not the best way of looking at it. Although that was something that I was thinking about right after I read The Great Tanuki War. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, I, I do really enjoy all of these volumes. Let's, though kind of back up a bit because for those of our listeners who may not be familiar with the character Kataro or even the work of Sagero Mizuki, um, they may be wondering, okay, what the hell are these guys talking about? Who is this character Kataro? So how would you describe the concept, uh, the context of Kataro? Um, or Kitaro, if you prefer. So, um, Kataro is a young boy who is the last surviving member of the ghost tribe, which is a kind of community of uh, yokai, which is a Japanese term that um, I think is most commonly applied to um, to like Japanese folkloric spirits. Mm-hmm. Monsters. Um, yeah. Um, but Z- I, think, I think it's in a note from Zach Davis and the translator who notes that yokai... Um, can actually refer to um, any sort of like uh, supernatural or otherworldly creature. Um, he, I think he um, mentions that yokai can come out of outer space. I know uh, in one story, the villain is Dracula the Fourth, um, mm-hmm. who who has fled to Japan because uh, hung the the Hungarians discovered that he was a vampire. Um, but so uh, Kitaro is is this young boy, this young yokai boy, um, <clears throat> and his father is a an eyeball. <laughs> um, and you an get eyeball. by the way, by the way, you get a lot of this backstory in this very first story of the uh-huh. first volume, yeah, yeah. the birth of Kitaro, uh, because his birth is actually in the grave, right? Uh-huh. To, to bring home the horrific element, or at least the roots mm-hmm. of this character. Uh, the mother dies, and she's still pregnant when she is buried. And then Kitaro, once he is born, kind of crawls out, literally crawls out of the grave. But the father, though, is not buried, because I think the human who buries the mother 
feels that the father's a little too repulsive because he's decomposed to such a point. But there's his spirit inhabit in in, in the father again, whose name is uh, Madama Oyaji, looks like a mummy, right? I mean, <laughs> for all practical purposes. In fact, he, his image is on the cover of this first volume, The Birth of Kataro. But his spirit is, I guess, transferred or embodied in yeah. one of his eyes. And so as the father is dying, the spirit literally pops out, the eye pops <laughs> out, and makes its way to Kataro because he is a good father and he is very attached to his son. And then um, they befriend, um, I think one of the books describes him as Kitaro's frenemy. <laughs> um, this character, Nozumi Otoko, who yeah. has, uh, from what I, I guess, the name literally translates to the rat man. And he has a kind of rat like face, but he's a half yokai, half human, who's very old. He's kind of dirty and gross and sleazy and, and gets into all sorts of shenanigans that Kitaro has to get him out of. Um, but basically, the series is this kind of uh, episodic series of adventures where Kitaro is uh, tasked with um, uh, saving in some sort of way uh, – human beings from yokai whether that's uh befriending the yokai or uh imprisoning the yokai or or any uh just basically getting rid of the yokai in some sort of way and so it's a a series of these adventures where uh kitaro and his father um encounter all of these creatures and um it's it's really just an excuse for mizuki to uh to draw and uh tell stories about these um the, these Japanese mythological and folklore creatures that he was uh, so obsessed about. Yeah, that he was raised on by his caretaker, Nononba. <laughs> yeah. Um, he is, uh, yeah, he was apparently like very, very obsessed with, with folklore, um, even going so far on like research expeditions to uh, find out, out about fairies in uh, the British Isles. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and the thing about Kitaro, and I like the way that you put it, um, that these stories in many ways is kind of an excuse or maybe a platform would be a better way of, better way of putting it uh, for Mizuki to explore the, the the kind of strange and rich folklore mm -hmm. of Japan and, and, and other places as well. And, and the reason why I come back to the way that you described it, kind of an excuse for him, because there are some things that go on in these stories that come out of nowhere. And, <laughs> you know, you just have to go with it, right? I mean, you learn in some – reading one of these stories and you learn out of the blue that Kitaro has a particular power. It's like, well, where the hell did he get that power? Well, that's yeah, he, just he – can, He can like uh, – uh, what in one episode – in one um... – story he is like attacked by a yokai and you think he's dead but then you find out that like oh no 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 he's just this like pile like melted pile of goop um <laughs> don't worry he'll he'll be fine yeah little um, things like that 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 <laughs> seem to come out of nowhere but i mean there are certain powers though that he has that are pretty clear across many of the stories uh -huh. you know one is the vest that he wears which is imbued with oh, what is it? it it's from his various ancestors right um the power or the spirit of his ancestors is that it and, and it gives I, him certain abilities that I other don't yokai don't have i don't recall the vest i know he can like um kind of disarticulate limbs and they can like they're oh, like his hand a, especially yeah yeah and uh his hair, he can like shoot spikes of hair. Yeah, um, but yeah the hair, yeah, the hair's a, a one that it, you find in many of the stories, yeah. and it's weird because his hair. You mentioned that they shoot out at sp as spikes, and so they can attack their projectiles. Uh -huh. But at times, his hair also is able to elongate well, and yeah. wrap up his his enemies, and also it functions as a radar. <laughs> Convenient. <laughs> um. Yeah, it's uh, 
there is, I think, um, I think these Kichiro stories really, really are the best example um, of, I think, something you can see in all of Mizuki's work, um, which is like, uh, like whimsy. He strikes me as a very whimsical person. And I think that these Kichiro stories are the kind of clearest, uh, most overt example of that. Um, you know, it's, you, you can see it in like, you know, what we talked about, um, uh, Onward Towards Our Noble's Death, Shigeru Mizuki's Hitler, Showa. Um, I think there are moments where you can see um, that aspect of, of Mizuki's personality, um, mm-hmm. but they are much more serious works than I think Kitaro is. And Kitaro provides a, a much better outlet to just kind of be uh, freer and looser and um, more kind of spontaneous in a way. Right. And, uh, you know, the use of the word whimsical, I think, is is quite appropriate because it underscores for me one of the big draws of these Kitaro stories, and that is its appeal to younger readers. And then in a kind of a broader sense, kind of all ages at the same time. But there are many things that go on in these stories. Again, some of these things that seem to come out of nowhere that you can tell that you know, Mizuki was thinking, oh, the kids will love this. Like, <laughs> like for instance, when, um, you know, Nozumi Otoko farts, in, you know, <laughs> oh, because yeah. he, he's, he's so it's... smelly and he's so repulsive that his farts are like atomic bombs. What, and... is he, what does it say? It says it. he can, uh, he farts and it's like enough, uh, uh, I can't remember what, but it's like it generates enough force to uh, like propel a rocket or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and so you can imagine <laughs> kids reading this and thinking, "Oh, that's great!" Because you know, you know, what kid doesn't like good uh, fart <laughs> stories uh, or, or or things that are just kind of repulsive, like bad breath or body odor or people's butts <laughs> or things of that sort. And you do get quite a bit of that in these stories. And more times than not, uh, this seems to revolve around Nozomi Otoko. Uh, but but sometimes it's Kitaro himself. Um, yeah. I mean, peeing. I mean, there's one story. Wasn't there oh, one there's story? Multiple, there's where multiple instances his, where um, his peeing he becomes pees on a weapon. Yeah. yeah. Again, I, I noticed that as well. I was really struck by not the one time it happens, but I think it's it's at least two, but I think it might be three or even four times where it's just very um, casually. Uh, he just like pees on something or someone to resolve um, some problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a very that's a very wheel weird kind of uh light motif. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But again, you I mean you can see the the kids really liking and laughing, snickering yeah. about something like that. Yeah. Um now we've mentioned this character Nozumi Otoko a couple of times. Um if you've never read a Katoro story in the past, but you have read Mizuki's Showa series, then you know who this character is and Mizumi or Nizumi Otoko plays a completely different role in the Showa series. He's much more serious there. I mean, there is kind of a lighter side to him to a point in the Showa books, but really he's a different kind of Nizumi Otoko than we get in Kitaro because in the Kitaro s- stories, you know, he's a, you know, as, as you pointed out, Shay, a half yokai. But he's someone who is very selfish. He always is in it for himself and especially a buck. So if he can make money or earn food by doing something, even betraying his friend Kitaro, then he'll do it. He's also someone who is a little bit on the cowardly side. Instead of standing up for what is right, like Kitaro does, uh, what Nozomi Otoku will do is to decide who is eventually going to be the winning side? That's the side that I'm going to be on. And so there are many of these stories where the supposed friend of Kitaro, Nozomi Otoko, decides to do things that aren't in Kitaro's best interest and even to actively work against the safety of Kitaro. Um, yeah, he uh, – I mean he changed his side at least, at least twice, I think maybe three times in the um... – the vampire yurt story that we yeah. mentioned earlier, <laughs> um, which is where he 
we find out that his his farts are so powerful. It's that story. <laughs> Yeah, and he, and he is in some ways the comic relief of these stories, uh-huh. although I think that a lot of what these stories are built on are rather comic. Uh, you know, f- those things that are associated with Kitaro and then other characters as well. But by far, Nozomi Otoku is not the only yokai in the Kitaro world because most of these stories are encounters and sometimes hostile encounters mm-hmm. between Kitaro and another yokai where a yokai is causing problems if not for other yokai then humans and so if if it's humans then humans use yokai mail in order to reach Kitaro <laughs> so yokai mail apparently is a special kind of post and there are different like post boxes around that people can leave letters for Kitaro Kitaro please come help us we have this problem with the yokai <laughs> and then eventually Kitaro will read the mail and come and help the humans and so each but but most of these stories revolve around Kitaro fighting or encountering in some way another yokai Mm-hmm. And sometimes these yokai are hostile, sometimes they're not, but they're always colorful and strange. And one of the things I really appreciate about Zach Davison's uh, work, I mean, there's the translation and there's this this ongoing history of Kitaro, mm-hmm. but in mm-hmm. the back of each volume, we get a little description of the main yokai that uh-huh. appear in the stories. And so you get to find out a little bit about them, what their powers are, what characterizes them. And many times that information is not apparent in the stories themselves. No. And I think, um, um, I think I saw in one of the volumes and this could be a note in all of them. Um, but I believe that, uh, he includes that section principally, um, because there isn't, you know, an opportune spot in the story, uh, they're a little like end notes, I guess, rather than right. footnotes, whether uh, where in the story he could explain um, in greater detail the um, kind of what this yokai is, you know, um, details about some like folkloric details associated with um, the yokai. Um, but in this, you can go and you can, uh, you know, the, 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 the comic itself is, is uninterrupted. And then if you are curious, he provides that information in the back. And like you, I found that um, fascinating because, um, you know, for some of these yokai uh, I had I had heard of before or I had um, kind of seen images before um, in other manga or in like um, ukiyo-e, uh, like woodcut prints. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I did really appreciate having that uh, that information there. Um to learn more about these creatures that I had never encountered before. Yeah, of course. A good example of this is in the first volume, the very last story of this first volume, uh, Hideti Gami, which appeared in Shonen Weekly in May of 1968. The main yokai is the title character, Hideri Gami. And in the back, in the yokai files section that Zach Davison has, I mean, you get a description of Hideri Gami and what distinguishes him as a yokai but there is another yokai that we see toward the end of this story called nozuchi and we see some of what nozuchi does but you don't really get much context you know one thing an editor could have done is to include as you pointed out kind of a footnote something that appears at the bottom of the page that gives you a little background information and context about the nozuchi um But in the yokai files at the end of the book, this is where Zach Davison uses the space to get into more detail. So you turn to the back and it says, Yozushi are powerful snake-like creatures covered in fur like a caterpillar in one of the earliest known yokai in Japan. They have no ears or eyes, just a sucking mouth. They eat (laughs) everything that they can fit inside. Nozushi move by rolling down hills, then crawling their way back to the top like an inchworm. Some of that stuff, some of that information you could have gathered from the story. For instance, him you know, sucking things through the, the mouth in the front. But other things like one of the earliest known yokai in Japan and how it rolls down hills and then crawls back to the top like an inchworm, you don't get in that story that it appears. Yeah, that, that aspect of the um, – of that – I'm struggling to like – what's a good way to like describe what that is? That like paratext – 
or um, kind of supplementary material in the back is um, – It's like an index in some, some way yeah, or, or, or um, of, a glossary. Or sorry, yeah. A, a glossary, glossary would be a good way, yeah. a good way to describe um, what it is. And, and I think um, – I think yeah, it is. It is. It's good to have that because, um, like you said, there it, it includes information that uh, isn't really in this. It's not maybe necessarily in the comic itself, or even you know, it includes details that may not even be relevant to the comic. Um, but it does provide an opportunity to kind of learn more and and, and for readers to educate themselves about um, this world that. Uh, that Mizuki is is working in and, and building, um, and building upon um, in a in a in a way that I think is really interesting without being um, kind of like maybe too academic or too dry. Um, it's mm-hmm. very easy to read, um, and it's very accessible um, for new readers. And and uh, hopefully, it you know someone reads it and you know sparks an interest in um, in yokai or folklore. Yes. Now, before we move on to the next title that we're going to be looking at, uh, yeah, I just have to ask you, is there a particular Kitaro story that really stood out to you? Now, I know you said a little while ago that The Great Tanuki War was one of your favorites, and then uh, The Vampire Eret uh, as well. But of the among the first five volumes and all the stories that are collected there, is there one that really stood out to you as the most enjoyable or the the wackiest? Um, you know, I I did really enjoy the two that you mentioned. Um, those are the two that I think um stick out most in my mind. But I really enjoyed, and I can't remember the name of the story, but it is the one with it's the story with Dracula. I thought that was a really enjoyable one. It's Dracula, and then Dracula ends up fighting some other yokai um, uh, over Kitaro. They're both trying to like feed on Kitaro. And uh, God, oh, I can't is this in this uh, uh, Adoro Adoro versus Vampire? Yes, in the second yes. volume. Yeah, yes. this came out in 1968 in Shonen Special Edition. Yes. Um, I enjoyed that one. I thought that was really wacky and goofy. Um, all of the kind of dialogue um, f- coming from and directed at uh, Dracula, I thought was really funny. Um, but I also really liked um, uh, the first story in the birth of Kitaro, um, where we're kind of introduced to the character. And, and like we mentioned, it's, it has a much darker tone. Um, I, I uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that one primarily because of that kind of ambiance that it had that um, while I do really appreciate and really enjoy the kind of wackiness from some of the um, other Kitaro stories, um, there was something about the the kind of tone and atmosphere of that, that very, very early one that uh, I really, I really ended up liking. Uh, what about you? I know um, you enjoyed uh, the great Tanuki War as well, um, mm-hmm. but what other uh, shorter ones uh, really stuck with you? I don't know. I maybe one of the reasons why I ask you your thoughts is because I have a hard time <laughs> determining which one of these I think are my favorite because each in its own way has my attention or had my attention in a particular and in, in unique way. Um I don't know. I, I, I every volume has stories that that really stick out for me. Uh-huh. Uh one thing though and this has nothing to do with whether I like it or not. Th- th- this struck me as uh, a if not unusual then definitely notable. And it gets back to something that you were referencing earlier, that story in the second volume, Odoro Odoro versus Vampire. I think, isn't that the only story where we, of the five, among the five volumes so far, where we have as a title yokai a repeat, right? Because the story that immediately precedes that one is Odoro Odoro. And so we're introduced to Odoro Odoro, uh-huh. and then that next story, Odoro Odoro versus Vampire, is something unusual in that we get a repeat of a yokai adversary of Kataro's in two stories, one that follows the other, and that's nowhere to be found in any of the other volumes. I mean, mm-hmm. the closest thing you can get to that is a mentioning. In the first story in the second volume, Kataro meets Nurahiran. 
Uh, there's a reference to that in one of the later stories where I think it's Nazumi Otoku makes reference to to this other yokai, but we don't see him. Mm-hmm. And it's within the context of the the hand thing that you referenced earlier, Kataro's hand separating from his arm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Another one of his weird powers. I guess some of my favorite stories in these Kitaro volumes are ones that, and maybe this is the immature part of me coming out, <laughs> where there's some kind of weird power that someone has, like farting or Kitaro peeing, because <laughs> it just struck me as really unusual. It's like, what? It's like I get narrative <laughs> whiplash looking at it. Um, but uh, yeah, th- those really strike me as notable. Um, so do you want to move on to Paul Gravett's uh, Mangasia then? Yes, let's move on to Mangasia, The Definitive Guide to Asian Comics. This is written and curated, I guess, by Paul Gravett. It's published by Timms and Hudson, and this came out in November of last year. Now, Shay, both you and I got review copies of Mangasia because the publicist at Tim's and Hudson contacted us to ask if we may be interested in it because of our manga series, and we said mm-hmm. yes. Although this is a different kind of book that we're going to be discussing now. Almost, I think every other text that we have um, discussed on the monthly manga series has been a work of manga, actual work of manga, not a critical work or a pictorial survey of manga. That's what Mangasia is. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is something quite different from what we've discussed in the past. I guess this is the first time that you and I have discussed a work of criticism in some way or another on the manga series, although we've considered it in the past. Um, yeah, this is kind of a first for from or first for us, um, and it's actually not a book I have that much to say about so i would be curious to see how you found the book you know um uh did you enjoy hey, let's just start with did you did you enjoy the book yes i did and um let me let me give a little context here i guess as a way of leading into my appreciation of gravitz mangasia um if you're not familiar with the publisher Tim's and Hudson, it, it, it's a smaller press. I guess it, I think it's based out of the UK, as as you may you know guess from from the name Tim's T H A M E S is in the river. Um, I'm only familiar with one other book that they've done on comics, and this came out a few years ago. Comics: A Global History, 1968 to the Present. Uh, this was written by Dan Mazur and Alexander Dannon. I'm, I'm sorry, Danner. H- have you read that one, Shay? Um, I don't think I have. Yeah, and in many ways, it's a lot like Mangasia in that it is image heavy. I don't think near as image heavy as Gravit's Mangasia. But basically what this book does, Comics of Global History, is is what its title suggests, right, from 1968 to the present. It looks at three geographical regions where comics have really come into their own. North America, and and not just the United States, uh, but North America, Europe, and not just Franco-Belgian, and Japan. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think maybe Mazur and Danner discuss other kinds of Asian comics, but not near to the degree of what Gravid does in this book, Mangasia. But in many ways, it's similar, right? So there is quite a bit of text, but also there are a lot of images. So you get samples of the various texts that they discuss, covers, uh, art, and uh, that's what you find in Mangasia. Now, in Mangasia, the definitive guide to Asian comics... You know, Gravit writes quite a bit, but I i didn't do a word count, but I would guess that the text that accompanies the image, right, that tells us what an image is, who its artist was, and when it came out, and other kind of contextual information, that that kind of text is almost as plentiful as the critical text 
among the various chapters, and I believe there are are there like five chapters in this book, <clears throat> mm-hmm. uh, or six, right? Yeah. So the first chapter, well, there's a foreword, uh, Mangasia, a brief introduction by what the filmmaker uh, Park Chen Wook. Wook, yeah. Um, but then the six chapters that make up the book proper, Mapping Mongasia, Fable and Folklore, Recreating and Revisiting the Past, Stories and Storytellers, Censorship and Sensibility, Multimedia Mongasia. And I think in, in many ways, each of these chapter titles kind of tells you the focus of where Gravit was going in each of these chapters. But each chapter is made up of some critical text but primarily composed of visuals. And Mm -hmm. sometimes those visuals are sample art. Sometimes they're covers of of various works or magazines, what have you. Uh, Sometimes uh, like a cover image or some sample art can take up an entire page. At other times, you will have a variety of smaller images that compose a particular page with no critical text whatsoever. So, the critical writing in this book, Mangasia, is relatively a minor, if we want to say that, part of this text. But that's the kind of work that Gravit does. And so this is another kind of context that I want to introduce here, because you look at some of the other books that Paul Gravit uh, Gravit has, has come out with, and he did another book on manga back in 2004 that came out from Harper Design called Manga, 60 Years of Japanese Comics. Very similar to this. Um, another book of his that I think is really interesting, really good, is a great introduction to, to comics. This came out in 2005. Graphic novels, everything you need to know. He did the book that came out last year, Will Eisner, The Centennial Celebration, along with Dennis Kitchen. And he's done other similar books that have the same structure and feel as Mangasia, right? Very image heavy, a Mm -hmm. lot of covers, tons Mm -hmm. of sample art. And so his books are more, let's say, curated images than critical text, although at times there is quite useful critical text. So by saying that there's not as much criticism or critical writing in a lot of his books as there are images, I don't mean to downplay what he does at all, because I think that what he provides is a kind or a brand of criticism that is missing from other kinds of criticism and scholarship, and that is um, heavy dependence and reliance and emphasis on visuals. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that pretty much, uh, I think I would agree with that pretty much. Um, I think I'm definitely of, of two minds of the book. Um, like you said, the book is primarily images, um, which I thought was great. I think the size that Thames and Hudson, uh, produced the book at, um, the quality of the reproductions of some of these very obscure, you know, we're talking like Filipino comics, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Pakistani comics, um, uh, comics from the interior of China. They're um, comics titles and cartoonists and kind of trends in cartooning that I had never heard of. And um, this is a really, really great um, format to present that work in. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think on the one hand, I was really taken with um, the kind of breadth of the subject and the accompanying images i thought they were great um it was a real real treat to see some of that stuff um but then on the other hand i did feel like there was something really lacking about uh uh gravit's kind of critical writing um I i think my two biggest problems were I couldn't really make sense of how he was structuring his chapters. Um, they had, they seemed to have a very loose structure. Um, but then also, like you mentioned, the, the critical writing that is there is, is very sparse and it's, I would say it's more kind of descriptive, um, than, uh, maybe critical. It's, it reads to me very much like, a. 
um, like an encyclopedia article. It's very much about facts and names and dates and titles um, and and making sure the reader has all that information. Um, so I was I was really kind of torn about this book because um, Gravit's kind of contribution as a writer left me a little cold. They left me wanting uh, more. And I think um, had he narrowed his focus a little bit to maybe Japanese comics or um, Indian comics or Chinese comics or comics from Hong Kong or comics from the Philippines, um, he would have been able to write about those subjects with a little more depth. Um, but uh, like we've both said, the the um, breadth and quality of images in the book is terrific. It's just absolutely terrific. Right. You know, and I think it bothered me less, if at all. I don't think it bothered me at all, because I more or less knew what to expect. Uh, you know, you mentioned something about the format and the size of this book, Mangasia. That's another thing that you will find in not all, but many of the works that Gravit does. Uh-huh. They're kind of larger <laughs> size. Uh, you know, some you could even potentially call uh, coffee table books in a way. Uh, this is not a hardcover, but it is kind of a stiff, um, softer cover with a, a dust jacket on it. And so it, mm-hmm. it is kind of a nicer quality book. And, and that's the kind of thing that he does. So when I picked this up and started to read it I, and, and saw that, you know, this was a, a, a new Paul Gravit book, I more or less knew what to expect because I'm familiar with his other books and the kind of presentation that he usually comes up with. And I'm perfectly fine with that. And like I said earlier, what he does in his kind of presentation, his covering of comics or coverage of comics, is very different from what you get in Mm -hmm. other kind of critical presentations, even those that may be more, as you were pointing out, more fact-based and encyclopedic in nature. So, for instance, you know, picking up this book, I did not expect it to be a work of comics criticism, let's say, published by University Press of Mississippi, or Mm -hmm. even uh, something that maybe, you know, Frederick Schott has written, Manga Manga, Mm -hmm. The World Mm -hmm. of Japanese Comics. So I knew what to expect, and I knew what I was getting with this book, and so I wasn't disappointed at all. I mean, if anything, I was kind of thrilled with the fact that there are so many visuals. And you find that in a lot of graphics books, but there seemed to be something much more richer in Mangasia. And I think part of that richness, or at least the discovery of the richness for me, is something that you alluded to alluded to a moment ago, and that is the way that Gravit brings in manga from not just Japan, but a variety of nations and cultures that we really don't think about when we think about manga. The first chapter of this book, which is Mapping Mangasia, I think is one of its high points, because what he does is he gives a fairly open, but to a certain degree, I think appropriate definition, uh, at least as he sees it, of manga. Because, you know, Mm -hmm. a lot of people think that maybe manga is limited to Japan or manga is a particular style. And as we've discussed on this manga series, you know, throughout its existence is the fact that, well, it may be this to some degree, but not in other ways. And I think in his trying to define manga, it's open enough to accommodate other things that people may not consider manga. But also he points out uh, painstakingly in this opening chapter that while Japan has really been kind of a mover and shaker when it comes to Asian comic art, um, it's not the only influence. It's not the only force. Other cultures have its own histories, its own aesthetics, its own styles that may have been influenced maybe just as much by Western comics as Japanese manga. Yeah, there is um, there's a very, very brief passage. It's maybe two like a paragraph and a half, maybe two full paragraphs in the middle of this book um, about North Korean comics. And if anyone listening can get me like a scan (laughs) <laughs> of these North Korean comics, I would love, I would love to just be able to see them because, yeah, there was stuff like that in the book that was like, I had no clue there were comics in North Korea. 
I would I really want to go look at those um because I bet they're really weird. Um especially I think he quotes um he quotes like Kim Jong Il. The current uh, one is Un, isn't it? Or Yes. Yeah. Um he quotes Kim Jong Il, I think, um saying that like, oh well basically like comics are okay now, but they have to um something about like they have to um get people excited about fighting the enemy <laughs> <laughs> um or, or 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 something like that um so yeah there's uh, some of these like sm- much much smaller um comics markets um you know there's some really interesting stuff there that that gravit pulls out um you know and you know drawing lines and it, it does make you really wonder like how did the kind of um authoritarian regime of Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines affect the kind of comics output um and i that wasn't something that had ever occurred to me but now i'm really curious <laughs> um so yeah i think i think the, the gravit introduces a number of of comics industries that i had never thought about before or or seen anything from before um and he really got me excited to like learn more about it um so in that respect the the book is i think a resounding success yeah and you know i want to underscore what you said is he discusses and then shows us some examples when Mm -hmm. he can of comics from nations and cultures that we really I mean, not only do we, or at least I, don't immediately think of when I think of manga, but I don't think of when I think of comics as a whole. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, I mean, I I do very much appreciate that. And in that first chapter, you know, Mapping Mangasia, he does point out that, uh, you know, manga is much more than what you find in Japan. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the the, the powers of this book, Mangasia, that I really mm-hmm. enjoyed. Um, now, you know, I've been singing the praises of that first chapter, but you know, the other five also are quite insightful and useful in one form or another. Is there one that really stood out? One of the chapters for you? Um, you know, I'm trying to think if there was one that really stood out because there's one that really stood out to me and for (laughs) i guess uh obvious guy reasons um censorship and sensibility chapter five (laughs) uh yeah and there's some uh let's just say quite interesting and revealing images that gravit includes in that one and you know i i joke about this you know oh, you get to see breast but I, I mean but what he does in this chapter is he points out something that is definitely out there for discussion right i mean one thing that at least some readers may have against manga is the for some of it at least the highly sexualized nature of it especially when it comes mm-hmm. to representing young women You know, Mm -hmm. sometimes even, you know, prepubescent girls. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, Gravit discusses this history, right? Uh, And and not just in a more titillating way, but also the more experimental kind of manga, some of which we've discussed on previous episodes episodes of the manga series, uh, that deal with disturbing issues, not only in terms of horror, but also of sexuality and eroticism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't disagree that that's a, certainly an interesting, certainly interesting chapter. Um, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't know if I have a, I have a favorite. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, another thing that this book does is it juxtaposes images, covers, and what have you from older texts and works mm-hmm. of art with much more contemporary stuff. So there is a mention in a brief discussion, or at least con- con- contextualizing, of something like a One Punch Man, mm-hmm. uh, which we've discussed on the show before. But also, it reminds me of some of the things that every now and again, I think Shay and I should discuss on the show. So, for instance, there is a reference at one point to Lot's Kampung Boy, 
that hmm. you know actually was published by First Second along with uh, Town Boy in 2006 and 2007. And that's something that you and I could potentially mm-hmm. discuss on this show if we ever get around to it. But but little things like that, right? So I do like the fact that a book like this does give, you know, maybe as you described it, more encyclopedic in terms instead of critical overview of comics in Asia or manga in Asia, Mangasia. Um but it does so within kind of a larger historical context. So mm-hmm. it definitely doesn't suffer the, I, I guess, weakness that maybe more some, – some other works that deal with manga do, and that is maybe have – weighting the more contemporary examples of manga more just because that's what's selling. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean uh, even the stuff um – where he's talking about uh, ukiyo-e, like woodblock prints and kind of the development of manga um, through hokusai um, and how um, I think early, early um, Japanese animation was a big um, influence in the history of the development of like the um, something we talked about, I think uh, last earlier this month, uh, the Yonkoma, the four the four panel gag strip. Um, mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, in many respects, um, Gravit does a, a really excellent job kind of splaying out uh, a really rich and full and diverse history of, of manga from these uh, very old roots to very contemporary examples. Um, yeah, I think, I think my problems with the book were, um, you know, I had read a, a Paul Gravit book before. I read his, I think it's called Comics Art. Comics Art, um, yeah. Yeah, I think I wrote about that for the Comics Alternative blog when it first came out. Um, and I had similar problems with the book. It, you know, there were some um, some passages I thought were really strong and some passages I thought were um, kind of cursory. Um, but I think I, I expected this to be a little, even maybe a little bit more like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I am. I'm really glad that I, I ended up reading it and we ended up talking about it because, um, you know, for especially for listeners who are interested in learning more about um, the history of manga and the history of comics throughout Asia and kind of what um, these different markets have produced aesthetically. Um, I, I think it's a terrific book. Um, yeah, and you know another thing that I get, you know, earlier I said that my reaction is a little different from yours because you know being familiar with some of the kind of books that Gravit has come out with previously, this is more or less what I expected. Another thing that fed into my expectations for Mangasia is I knew that these are the kind of books that Tim's and Hudson publishes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier comics of global history, nineteen sixty eight to the present. But if you go to the Tim's and Hudson website or just do a search for their releases on Amazon, you'll see that, at least from what I've gathered, the vast majority of the books that they do publish are more arts oriented. So Mm -hmm. they're in many ways like Abrams in the United States Uh Mm -hmm. uh, in that a lot of the texts that they put out deal with art and artists or art movements or art styles or what have you. So there's going to be a heavy investment in the visuals. And so Mm -hmm. I knew that going into Mangasia, that's probably what I would, would see. And lo and behold, it is. So, Shay, an interesting conversation for our January episode of the manga series. We started off by discussing various Kitaro books by Siguru Mizuki, put out by Drawn and Quarterly. And those include The Birth of Kitaro, Kitaro Meets Nuraharyan, Kitaro, The Great Tanuki War, Kitaro Strange Adventures, and the most recent one that came out this month, Kitaro the Vampire Slayer. And then after that, you and I looked at Paul Gravitz Mangasia, the definitive guide to Asian comics, which was published in November by Tim's and Hudson. A lot of good things to discuss and check out. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, our listeners, if you do 
have your hands on or know where we can see some images of North Korean manga, yeah. <laughs> definitely get in touch with us and we will feature your correspondence on the February manga show. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Um, and if you want to find great texts like this, then you would do well, our friends, to check out the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com, and there you will find incredible discounts on a ton of manga. That's dcbservice.com. Or you can check out their sister company, In Stock Trades. That's instocktrades.com. They have a lot of manga as well. And after you do get your manga there, get in touch with us and let us know if you know where to find any North Korean manga. <laughs> if you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can contact us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. You can also send us an email or two. Uh, you can email the show at two guys at comicsalternative.com. Uh, you can get in touch with me directly at Shay at comicsalternative.com. And Derek, what is your email address? Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also contact us via social media. We have accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google Plus, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, and we have a Slack channel. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. So why don't you take a cue from uh, Zach Fig, Jason Rulane, and Sogjawar on YouTube and let us know what you think about our manga episodes. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. And until next month, I'm Derek. And I'm Shay. Take care. <laughs>